Hi everyone, it's Alex from the Hellbound podcast. This is the last in a series of interviews that took part during the original Hellbound Horror Festival. We've got some surprises coming starting next week, so please check that out. Lawrence is the screenwriter of the 1981 horror classic called The Fun House. The director was Toe Pooper from Texas Chainsaw Massacre fame. He's also worked with the likes of Stan Lee, so please check out the podcast and let us know what you think. So, uh, Larry, welcome to the Hellbound interviews. How are you doing? My absolute pleasure. I'm excited to be here. Uh, yeah, I uh, I revisited um, Funhouse uh, last night, and it'd been about I'd say about five years since I'd seen it. Really? Um, yeah, and it, re- it honestly really does stand up. It really stands up. And the first thing I'll say is, I was watching it because we've just had our TV fixed. We were about to send our OLED TV up. We bought a new TV, a really nice one. I thought, right, we're going to watch it on that. But it's basically failed yesterday. That's had to be sent away. And I watched it in the kitchen and there's these big windows next to me. So it's a really kind of spooky area to watch it, which is great for me. And um, the titles, the t- opening titles uh, are terrifying. It kind of, there's a lot of, I think I messaged you yesterday a, or I wrote this down. It reminds me a lot of Westworld, not just because of the robots, but tonally there's something kind of very creepy about the park or the carnival uh that's kind of unspoken and um it's yeah i really really enjoyed it <laughs> uh, I, I i will tell you one thing about the titles that nobody really knows and I, i'm okay. sure they ex- they exist someplace but originally when they always were going to do the marionette puppets, you know, and they were trying to get them to, to match up like the producer looked like a producer and the writer obviously had a, had a, yeah. a pen and quill in hand. But when the titles popped on in red, they originally had blood dripping from the red yeah. down and they made a decision to take it out. I, th- I, you know, to this day, I don't understand because it was so cool. I was so excited when I saw that. Yeah. It's kind of a, a shame sometimes, and I, yeah, I, I think it. I think it really did work though, and and like, I'm just going to refer. I'm not going to look down too often in my notes, but I've got. Okay, um, go ahead. Go ahead. One of the best things, compliments I can give you and Tobe, uh, Tobe Hooper, the director, is that the kids or the uh, high high school kids aren't annoying. For me, when they're in that car together, they could have quite easily been just started to annoy the hell out of me because we've all seen it in films where they're just really dumb kids um but they're they're getting on and they they feel like a real group of friends i know there's something i've skipped in terms of the the little mask being put on looking around the room but the kids aren't annoying that's how that's exactly what i found straight away we we, you know i that dialogue is all my dialogue and uh i wanted them to come across again remember you have to put this in in uh perspective in terms of the year it was written in yeah this was basically my recollections of what i was like at that age uh or a little bit older like freshman year in college and uh yeah they had they had different personalities they represented different things and uh and I always, you know, put myself in their shoes. But I will tell you uh, something I, I like to say a lot, which is that once actors are signed on and they begin working together, they own the part. The, 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 the actors know more about their own characters than the director and even the writer because they really own the part. And when, when they're having trouble owning it, they usually ask questions and later on we can talk about that but so i got a couple of phone calls uh, during the shoot where they were asking like well, what like richie wanted to know why am i stealing that money why why am i doing that and uh you know so toby gets on the phone with me and says i need you to talk to richie and explain to him why and uh, i give him an explanation which is why because you're sort of you know a little bit jealous of uh, of buzz and uh, he's the big shot of the group and he's the, you know, the, the macho guy of the group. And you're doing this basically to show off and, and, to, and to up yourself in terms of, 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 of that group. Uh, so that's the reason why you're doing it. And you're going to split it. You're going to come across as being a hero, uh, which I, I mean, 
I would never do it, but I can certainly relate. I can certainly relate to people doing something like that. And uh, yeah. but they owned it. They were they, they they were great. They played they played really well together. So, so behind the scenes, were they was the kind of camaraderie? Because you hear about stories of younger actors, you know, being having a, a nice bond on set if things are going well. Is was that? Would you say that's a fair point? I, I, I was only on set, I, I, I was on set for pre-production. I was there like for 10 days of pre-production and then they, they wanted to get me off the set. Why? Because we had an issue on the film. Uh, Toby understood the movie obviously because I worked with him after he got interested in the script and you know, uh, and, uh, but one of the producers in particular basically didn't like didn't like the script <laughs> didn't like the movie and that is a disaster yeah. so i felt really bad that after i mean i i spent 10 days with toby i was with mort rabinowitz the the, uh, the set designer who had done uh warriors believe great it or not I'm, so, I'm, so, I'm, so, I'm sorry i'm sorry I, I got it wrong no uh mort rabinowitz was the, was, was was the set designer who did they shoot horses don't they and Castle Keep, which were all basically one big set movies, you know, if you know, and, yeah, yeah, and yeah. then, and then Andrew Laszlo, who had done Warriors, um, and a whole bunch of other things was, was, was the DP. And it we, was, I love one of the, yeah, one of the first things I know, obviously there's a lot of first things, but, um, I'm a huge fan of anamorphic and it was, oh, that was... For, for a start. It's, um, it's very efficient and it's, it fairly feels very lean. There isn't like a, a shot that's kind of out of, out of, um, out of kilter with the rest of the film. Like when the, the little kids waiting for his, I think it's his, his, his uh, sister. Um, and there's a big crane move. Where he's uh, just about to, when he's just yeah. about to leave, it make all makes so much sense. And I've got to say, right? Uh, let me just. I'm sure I, this is. Yeah, I don't need to look at that. Um, the sense of uh, reality with that park or that con. Let's call it carnival. With that carnival, it you rarely see that. You feel it's so fake, and the, the amount of people, the way it's shot, it felt like something you would go and visit. Well, let me tell you, let me, you, quick background. When I was 16 or 17 years old back east, this is, you know, we're, we're in USA right now. So when I was back east in New York, uh, I, I used to go to summer camp. And we once went to a county fair. And that county fair was basically exactly what this was. Yeah. And it, it freaked me out as a kid, as a teenager. I, I, I couldn't believe it. They had all. There were the smells and the sights and the sounds and and they had and they had girly shows and you know and and lots of forbidden things where you had to be eighteen to be able to do these things, and uh, it it made such an incredible impression on me that I always knew that one day this is going to make a, a a great setting. But so I wrote it. I when I when I wrote the script, I put all the elements that I remembered that they had at that fair. And then of course I did a lot of research. I research everything I always do about what county fairs have and, you know, and, and, and what they're notorious for and about carny life and all this. But what they did was when they made a decision to do this and to, to shoot this in Florida, Florida is the home base for carnivals when they're on hiatus. So they actually oh, hired good. a real carnival with real carnies working the equipment so that was all real as a matter of fact it was so real that they ran short on funds and they decided when they were shooting the scenes that they're going to open it up to the public they're going to they're going to charge admission you're going to be in a movie and they're going to take the money from the admission and put it into the production that's so incredible what, what you're seeing is is a totally legitimate um carnival i've never heard the only of that thing, before i've the, never the heard only of thing that before, it's, yeah. the, the only thing that's totally different about it is the fun house which was designed very carefully by mort rabinowitz uh who was a genius uh 
and again, I spent a lot of time with Mort and with and with the DP. They were asking me like, "What did we? What were you going for here? What did you want here?" And I, I they were like amazing. I was that's I mean, awesome. You know, and that's I was a great, to, great collaboration. No, no, I was able to explain to them. And Toby was was totally in sync about this because he gravitated toward this from the very beginning. Later on, if you want, I need to tell to set the record straight about how the project actually came about because yeah, there's lots great. of uh, lots of falsities about. It. But we knew exactly what we wanted to do. We knew that, that this was basically, uh, this was like a, a kind of like fun kind of an environment that was dreamy and slowly but surely in increments was gonna get darker and darker and more surrealistic until you get to the ending where Amy is hysterical and she's uh -huh. hallucinating. She's hallucinating. Uh, and there were scenes in there that were never shot of her, you know, there's one in particular where she's being chased. There, there was like a, it was a, like a eight minute chase she was supposed to have in that movie that was never shot. And that chase was after Buzz was killed where she's literally being stalked by the monster. And the monster, believe it or not, when his father dies, the Barker dies, imprints on Amy. And he wants her. I mean, there was the same way he was seeking affection from uh, Liz that went wrong when she when she panics and kills him. So he wanted her. There was a foreshadowing for her being, you know, the bride of Frankenstein in the very beginning of the movie. Uh, oh, that's with, interesting. Yeah. So there, there were so many layers in metaphors. I have a I have a literary background. I got a, a master's degree in literature at the uh, University of New Hampshire. So I, I really had studied you know, literature and great, you know, and storytelling and the, and the, and the classics and, you know, gothic, um, you know, horror. And so I had really layered it and textured it because I, I knew it was a relatively simple story, but it was imperative for me that everybody understood that we're going to, number one, treat the audience to an environment that they haven't seen before from the inside, uh, they're going to experience it the way the kids are experiencing it, and it's going to evolve from fun and games that are fake, and obviously simulated this and simulated that, to you know, to a magician who's doing a show where you think it's I real. I love that scene. And there's a, there's a lot to tell about that because Bill Finley, I, I, Bill Finley was incredible. Uh, well, I was with Toby when we hired Phil, Bill Finley, and Toby calls up Bill because he had worked with him on uh, on um, you know the, the, the what do you call it Eaten Alive. Yeah, I think he, I think he was in the, you know yeah, and he and I and and so Finley said I'm in the room with Toby and and Toby says well, let me call Bill Finley we'll try to get Bill Finley, and he calls hey Bill it's Toby how you doing listen I got this movie I'm doing we we we're, we're starting very soon. We did, so he said, Bill, I'm, I'm listening in. I'm hearing the conversation. Bill says, it's not, a, it's not another one of those like typical, like one of your typical movies, is it? Because he had just done, you know, I guess it was uh, um, uh, Eaten Alive. And Toby said, no, 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 it's really different. We've got like, you know, Mort Rabinowitz and we got, we have like Andrew Laszlo who did The Warriors and we got a great script. So Bill says, well, could you read me some of my lines? And Toby picks up the script and begins reading that monologue that I had written, you know, for Bill Finley about, you know, the explanation for Vlad the, the Impaler and, and that's, the, 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 that's the, you know, the, the, the background for the Dracula yeah. myth, which means it's really based on reality. And I was telling the audience that, you know, that these things actually can be real and they have a foundation in real life. So he, he reads him his scenes and Bill says, okay, I love it. I'll, I'll do it. And, and he signed on. But the point that I was making is, is that Toby understood the movie so well, because I, I basically, you know, I, when I first, when I first met him and he asked me what I was going to, what I was working on, I told him a project called the fun house. And he goes, I'd love to see you almost done with it. I said, I got another couple of weeks of work. And uh, he said, well, I'd love to see it when you're done. Uh, so Toby got it a hundred percent. Uh, yeah. Mark Lester, who was one of the executive producers, who was really not involved in the production, he had gotten the money, he had put up the money. Uh, uh, Derek Power liked horror. He had done uh, uh, Peter Weir's uh, The Last Wave, 
I don't know if you if you know that that I, restaurant. I, I know the I know the director, but I don't know that film though. Okay, well, he, he I mean, he's a, he, he, he was, you know, uh, but, but this was, this was the, this was the producer, this was Derek Powell who had produced this. Right. But, but one of the other producers basically from the beginning said, I don't get this. I don't like this. And, and I, I can't even believe it because when I had, when I, after pre-production, I basically left Toby uh, without like having a wingman, somebody who could basically, you know, bolster and, and take care of business in terms of understanding what was going on. Now, again, the DP and, 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 the, uh, and the set designer and the costume people and, you know, everybody else who was on the set, they all got it. But uh, I, 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 just, I just felt really bad that I couldn't. And, Anyway, um, where were we? They, 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 okay, you were talking about the titles and the yeah, and uh, the the actors that well, it wasn't the actors; it's your script and the direction. And the, the kids weren't annoying, and that's such a it's such a welcome relief because instantly, because I've seen we've all seen like a thousand films, but when we watch these kids, go right, these are going to be annoying. You 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 know you have this subconscious kind of thought about it, and they weren't just completely normal getting on with life so it wasn't really over the top goofy or anything like that they they um, got along really well and i know that because when the movie opened in hollywood and uh and i was on hollywood boulevard i actually bumped into it you know it was at the egyptian theater or something i actually bumped into uh uh to cooper huckabee and elizabeth barrage and they were together they were holding hands they were so excited about that's the, great. the movie which was which was so sweet and, and i remember them you know, one of them getting a, you know, getting into, a, I guess they had pay phones or something. He, he said, oh, they, you know, they're, they're, they're you know, I, I just heard from a friend in Atlanta and they're like screaming, they're going crazy for this movie in Atlanta. This was, this is this one when it opened worldwide. Yeah. Uh, so, but yeah, there's a chemistry and, uh, but I wrote them jokes that, that, that joke with the, uh, with the, with the, uh, with the duck that, you know, that, you know, uh, hopping up on the hot plate. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, and and Buzz being awkward and, you know, and, and re making sure that she got the joke, you know, and she's like, I got the joke. Meanwhile, they had all smoked dope before they went in. And that was like, that was like funny and, and different. And, yeah. you know, there was yeah. that line with, uh, with uh, you know, they, I don't think they're hitting, you know, I don't think they're getting along so well. And then Richie says, of course, they're getting along. And then Liz says, yeah, well, when 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 you're stoned, everybody, you know, including Charlie Man, <laughs> is, is, is 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 a great guy. Yeah, but yeah, they, they, I wrote the, the the quips and the little back and forth. They they they, they did some ad libbing, uh, but you know, they were they were great. They were really great. Um, I love. Um, sorry, okay. go ahead. By the way, uh, you can look this up. Cooper Huckabee is very proud of the fact that he got the job in Django Unchained, you know, with the, the Quentin Tarantino movie. Who he, is he in that? He plays one of the, he, he's much old, obviously he's much older. He plays one of the, one of, I think one of the bad guys who gets killed. Oh, wow. uh, Check that out, yeah. But, but he, uh, he's very proud of the fact that Tarantino said, well, I wanted to see you because I loved Funhouse. And you were so good. You were That's so good awesome. at Funhouse. That's That's awesome, yeah, yeah. It, 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 you know, I love I love when I hear things like this. But That's he great. was he was great. He 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 was he was he was great. He uh, you know a lot of people argue that oh the guy's a real a hole, but he's I a don't real hero. Think so? Yeah, he's a hero at the end of that movie. I mean, and then I had that scene where she where where I thought it was well right. The problem with writers is they think all their stuff is great when it's delivered properly, but. When 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 he, when when she says Buzz, how come how come you never asked me out before? Okay, this is the, the, like one third into the movie, yeah. and he says, "I don't know. Uh, I, I was afraid you wouldn't go out with me." And she says, "Well, I, I would have." And it's such a sweet moment, and they did it. It's so really nicely. nice. It's it's so through your writing and. Uh, it felt it felt right in terms of the pacing as well. I think that. Those little sweet moments, those little kind of personal moments between when you, when the group got split up, like, oh, I hope they're okay and all of that. It's it works so well. And like the kid on his own, I've, um, I um, it's it's her her brother, isn't it? 
the, yeah. one, the one that have the argument at the very beginning, which is a great opening, by the way. And um, I felt like alone with him. Do you know what I mean? Like I was in his shoes walking along the street and that guy is jokingly firing the shotgun at him. And uh, yeah, I think it were, I, I honestly, I think it's a really solid, solid film and it hasn't, it hasn't dated badly at all. No, I don't think so because it's like it's like nowhere. Another movie like that, which is one of my favorite movies, we can talk about later if you want to. Yeah, sure. Is it, is it follows? I I absolutely felt and that yeah. that also that's nowhere. It doesn't even it doesn't it, logically it doesn't make sense where it is because it's like disjointed. They have regular televisions, you know, tube television sets in there, and then they have a, they have funky, uh, you know. Uh, 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 the girl's reading off a seashell, uh, you know, little mini that's, reader. That's what that's what gave it the Westworld vibe for me. When I was watching that, it wasn't just that it was self-contained in the carny. It was the fact that what you said about the production, it was a real carnival group, and uh, and it all works so well. And that's why when they go into the funhouse, it starts to turn so kind of because just because you're like part of the atmosphere of going in, having a candy floss or whatever, and go, going to that peep show, like carving the hole in the peep show. I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> yeah. And uh, when people see that, if they haven't seen it, it's, it's hilarious. But yeah, it's the setup. It's a fantastic setup. And then it's like, obviously it turns really dark. And it's quite a, uh, it's quite a heartfelt story for, um, how would you describe it? The, uh, the sun you know, the uh, um, the monster, so to speak. It reminded me in elements of Frankenstein as well. And I love the little nods to Wolfman and Frankenstein at the very beginning of the film, in this, in the, which is a really nice... Um, it flips on its head. If you haven't seen it before, it flips on its head what you think is going to happen. You know, in the house, in the looking at all the things, in the, the puppets, right. and all of that. It's a really nice flip... Um, <laughs> And then it's like obviously the uh, kind of nod to Psycho in the shower, and then it kind of reveals what happens. And there's, there's literally, is. there's literally, if you look carefully, uh, when you get the POV shot of, 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 of it turns out to be Joey, but going yeah. through the room, we don't know who it is. Where he goes over to a clock, which has like a, it's like a ventriloquist dummy face on that's it. Right. Oh, that's creepy! Really, creepy. and it wink, and it winks. Yeah, and you were telling the audience. What you're seeing right now is a wink. Because just hang in there, okay? We're not ripping off Halloween, and we're not ripping off Psycho. Psycho. We're doing a homage, and like this is our, it's literally yeah. a wink. Exactly, and I think the use of like, there's a, the mirror to the, the head of that uh, dummy, it's like, there's no like obvious use of a mirror, but there's like, it, it just doubles what's in the room, and it, it is really a creepy opening. But it's great; it's a really great setup. It's by the way, the opening was entirely reshot. I hate to disappoint you. It, the footage was lost in Miami. Uh, what was uh, was it? A different opening? No, it was the exact same opening, but the footage was lost. Toby had moved on to another show, and they had someone else who uh, I'm trying to reconstruct who it actually was. And I, I haven't been able to do it, but I just haven't been able to. I don't know if I would reveal it if I if I was able to figure out who did it. Oh, I uh, see. Yeah. But 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 somebody else reshot that opening, and that was done on a closed set at Universal Studios uh, because they lost the footage. Th there were problems with with the Teamsters Union. Uh, uh, you can, that's written about, but you know uh, it's out there in the ether. But uh, the fact that somebody else shot that opening sequence really isn't. Um, I, were you, I were you happy how, were you happy, because uh, I want to break this down a little bit, were you happy how the opening came out? How it turned Absolutely. Out? The, the, I, I, the opening came out beyond my expectations. It looks and feels what it's supposed to look and feel like. I think that the, really you know. well the, shot. The, I, the, the whole it, film is really well shot. It's it's a it's a it's a it's an absolutely gorgeous film. The one thing that people criticize the film for is that it takes too long to get the action going. And I don't I, would argue, I don't agree with that. I I I thought it was absolutely imperative that the audience experience what it was like.
to be in this kind of an environment so that when the mask comes off and you see that there's a real monster under that mask, a real monster. I mean, I had it, it you know, it was like a troll. You know, only like recently do I realize how much it actually looks like the Morlocks in, uh, in Time Machine. Yeah, yeah, the original, it's, yeah. I never, I never even, I just recently. Oh, that's a good uh, point, yeah. But, but uh, I will tell you, I wanted the audience to be able to believe because I had taken them on this, 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 this arc and they switched, they switched one scene around, which I think hurt that. Which, in other that's, words, they did a scene. in the cut. What, what, what do they swap around? They swapped around the scene where uh, they, she makes a reference when they go to the freak show, which obviously the freak show is telling you that there, that there, are, that there are anomalies in this world. She makes a reference to the fact that it's just like what the magicians do. She hadn't seen the magician yet. So the magician was supposed to come first yeah. and, and you were supposed to, as an audience think, oh, this is all fun and games. And oh my gosh, this is terrible. They just killed this girl. It was an accident. No, it's, it, it's a trick. You know, Marco pulled the trick on them and, and, you know, and it, it's a trick. And then when you go to the next scene, it's supposed to be the freak show. And that's why Liz is making a mention saying, it's just like what the magicians do, saying it's not real. But we know that it is real, but there are anomalies like this, and we've seen freaks in bottles before. Yeah. So that was, that was the, the arc that I was doing, and for some reason, they decided to twitch it around another way. I'm, I'm, sure, it was, it, it, they, I'm sure they had a good reason for it, because yeah. uh, Verna Fields, who, was the, the, who became a VP at, at, uh, at Universal Studios. Really? Who had, wow. But she, she had, you know, she was the, the editor on, uh, on, on Jaws, Jaws yeah. and a whole bunch of other stuff. She came in as, and did a consult on it, and, uh, and, 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 uh, and that's what they came up with. But I, I just felt that it would, that delay it as long as you need to delay it for the audience to believe that it's real. Because by the time uh, Madame Zena comes on, and, you know, she's like a phony psychic, but then she gets her real vision. And her real vision is these kids are all going to die, which is why she, she the ad lib was, you know, get out, get out of here. But uh, her, her, her ad lib rather was, I'll break every fucking bone in your body. And that was, yeah. that, 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 that was great. She, she, was, she was amazing. That was great. That yeah. was really great. She wasn't a cliche because it was all real. Do you know what I mean? So well, she, well, like yeah. when that crystal ball rolled backwards, I'm like, yeah, that's, that's what she's real. That's, that 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 was that was a real moment and i and i yeah. and you know a lot of the other like you know the, the, the i like how there wasn't i like how there wasn't a close-up of one of the kids reacting to that making it obvious do you know what i mean it's like really subtly yes. done i thought oh that's interesting it kind of peaked or uh, when i watched it originally it really kind of peaked my interest that particular point and for me now uh, as an older guy just watching this again the things that interested me are like uh, all the character things in the build-up like the um the vampire and you think the girls died in the kind of coffin stand i yeah. I, I loved all that i think the production design of that that scene specifically i absolutely love it to bits and you're showing the progression and so many different facets of the carnival i, I think it's wonderful the one thing that i love especially about this and films with carnivals are those little dark shadowy areas behind tents i'm all sure. into those little pockets of shadow and I love seeing that in uh, in movies, especially. You have a guy. You have a guy taking a leak behind the tent. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And that and, woman's always watching the uh, the. I'll call her the old crone. She's always yeah. watching that. The two girls do this kind of rotating thing where they're talking, yeah. obviously to reveal a bit more of the background. And I I, th I spotted her like she's watching them. She's out of focus. I love that. Love it. She's the conscience. She's the one who said, somebody did a whole article on this. She's the conscience that says, God is watching you. Yeah, in the because, because, because it's a, it really, you know, my whole thing about horror is, you know, they're morality tales. Yeah, and absolutely. Which, absolutely. Makes, which makes me crazy when they try to reinvent the wheel sometimes in modern Hollywood and they get rid of that element of, of you know, of guilt and you know ta and breaking taboos that yeah. that's been part of horror from the very beginning that, 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 that goes it goes back to the classics 
it goes it goes back to Shakespeare. It goes it goes back to the you know uh, to the five books of Moses. This is all this whole idea of 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 there being a morality and taboos. And you many years ago when I was when I, I was used to do five meetings a week and I, I was like on a roll for a while, you know, getting other projects. I remember going to one of the studios and they wanted me to write a vampire picture for them, and. I said, I love vampire pictures because, you know, because it deals with this taboo. It's a universal taboo about eating blood. People do not drink blood. And that's what gives it its power because you're breaking the taboo. And I remember the guy sitting, you know, a development executive sitting back and going, well, you know, we want to do something different. What, what if it's not a taboo? What if, what, if, what if they're right and we're wrong? And I basically said to him, I can't do this movie. Because the whole energy, I mean, you look at a movie like Blade, they understand, it. I love the movie, the original movie Blade, the first one. Oh, they yeah. understand this, this is about blood is a taboo. This is where it gets its power from. So anyway, uh, yeah, they're, 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 the kids shouldn't be lying to their parents. The, 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 you know, the, the old woman who was, was, by the way, was a famous uh, Yiddish theater actress uh, uh, who, who played that part. Uh, and, oh, and by the way, there was another scene in the beginning with Joey. Let me tell you something very quickly about Joey. Um, there was a period of time where Toby, after he signed on, said, you know what, I, I'm having second thoughts. I don't think I'm going to do this because, you know, he was involved. There was something else. It might, it might have been, uh, um, I, I don't remember which movie it was because this was in between Poltergeist and, and, uh, um, and Salem's Lot. Anyway, uh, so there was a period of like 48 hours where Toby is saying, I, I don't know if I'm going to do the film now. So they brought in Joe Dante. And I met with Joe and I had a great, you know, we became friends and I had like two meetings with him. Now, I always had Joey in, in the movie and I had Joey, um, the mother was always an alcoholic. And I had Joey, after she, he gets screened, I go back to bed or so I'm going to, you know, that he's, he's back upstairs and he's doing something like what I would have done as a kid, which is he's got a flashlight and he's reading, you know, uh, under the covers, he's reading a book on Hansel and Gretel. Yeah. And the witch in Hansel and Gretel, it says it in the screenplay, and you can see this on the TV version of the movie, not the, you know, the, 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 the you know, it's a deleted scene. It's that it's that old lady crone is the, the, the witch is that old lady crone, which was also a foreshadowing. But um, Joe came up with the idea. Why don't we have, you know, I had a meeting with him. And he, why don't we have Joey uh, run away from home and try to get to the carnival? And I will tell you, that's that was, that was Joe's idea. Um, and I loved it. And, you know, I created all the scenes, you know, for it with it and then put him on the road and then. And yeah. then basically did what I thought would happen to a kid on the road in the Toby Hooper movie, which is that some <laughs> person will yeah. come by and say, kid, you want to ride? Which again is that taboo about, uh, I have so many people who, who, who have contacted me on Instagram saying, I would never hitchhike again after I, after I saw that movie. Yeah. I have other people, who, because of hitchhiking, I have other people who said, I would never lie to my parents. Because they, they, saw it, you know, they saw it on VHS or something when they were kids. I, w I would never lie to my parents about, you know, going, about going to a carnival like that. Yeah. But, but that was, uh, that, that, that was, uh, that was uh, uh, Joe Dante's idea to get the kid on the road. Cause that um, is a very scary, a very scary idea, you know, if well, you're, it that, is. If and, you're and, that and, young and, trying to find it, you know, he obviously well, and, he knows and, where it is, but trying to get there on your own, it's kind of a complete well, nightmare, you know. In the original script, and when they first shot it in Miami, there's a scene where you can actually see there's a telescope in the kid's room. And it's over, the window is oh. overlooking, and you can actually see the carnival lights in the script. This is in the script. Um, uh, and it's possible. That's that not in the film, is it? No. But in the TV version, which is the extra footage, they had done some kind of a, uh, a plastic transparency in the window oh, yeah, uh, I see. That, that looked 
like carnival, like carnival lights in the distance. But the wow. opening shot in, in this movie was was, was you're seeing you're, you're I actually I, I had a body being buried, which is not in the movie. If I ever make if I make the sequel, I will put it was like a a body being buried something a body being carried, which turns out to be a mannequin, but you don't know it. Uh, and when the camera pulls back, you're watching this from a telescope and the telescope is in the room and Joey, who's obsessed by the carnival, you can see on his wall is the carnival is coming to town. And, and he's the one who begs his sister, I want, bring me home a shrunken head, bring me home a shrunken head, which is not in the movie, except they shot the footage. This is what I call, I know this is, you know, you'll have to put this back in some kind of water, I guess. But the, the whole, I call it the mystery of the shrunken head. If you look very, if you watch it on Blu-ray especially, you can see, if you watch it projected, you can see the, in, in, in the whole climax of the movie with Amy, she's wearing a shrunken head on a string that's tied to her belt. Oh, okay. Yeah, she definitely. She actually, she actually promises her, her, her brother, I want a shrunken head, I want a shrunken head, I want a shrunken head, okay? The mother says, what the hell do you want a shrunken head for? And so Amy is saying, you're not getting anything because you did this. You're just for that, I'm not taking you to the carnival. And this is in the script. So she actually breaks down because she's a nice kid. And you actually see her, and there are photos. If you go online, you can see there's, there's photos. I do, I do a post of it, actually, where you, where you see that where she, she's at a concession. She points to this is, the one, this, is the, this is the shrunken head that she wants. And she picks it up. And, and Buzz takes it, this is in the script, they, they, they never shot it. And he takes it and he loops it around her belt and says, now you look like a headhunter, right? And so for the whole end of the movie, you know, when, they, when, when, they're, when they're stuck in the fun house, she's wearing that little shrunken head, which is around, you know, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. like the bigger than a golf ball. And it's, it's, it's on her belt. And in the script, at the end of the movie, when she, when, it, when they had the final confrontation, uh, the monster swats her. She goes flying backwards. The the shrunken head detaches from her belt, rolls across the floor a few feet. The monster sees this, looks at it, picks it up, and he's staring at it, and that's when she whacks him over the head with the crow with the crowbar. So ironically, it was supposed to me that by her softening up and deciding to buy a gift for her stupid brother, yeah, yeah. okay, it actually winds up saving her life because he gives her the moment to be able to whack the guy over the head. That was they, but you do see the shrunken head, but they, you know, they they just you know they just had her they they, they had the skeleton pop up, which distracts him. She whacks him over the head, and then uh, he backs up, and then he winds up, you know, going to the electrical grid that killed, you know, the electrical box that, that electrocutes yeah. him that allows him to get killed. I think um, uh, another, another great scene in that is when the, the girl uh, falls through. Well, the whole setup of the creature is fantastic. Like, walking around, you think it's just some, someone that's got something wrong, you know, like he's drunk or something like that. But I, I, there's something kind of the voyeuristic thing of looking at that scene with the, um, uh, is it the, the psychic? Is it the same, is it the same character, isn't it? That's uh, basically saying, I want more money to have, to do something with that's, you. Okay, that, that's the psychic, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they, that yeah, that the scene, the, the, the voyeurist, voyeuristic nature of that is to watch someone who's, deformed or physically deformed like that character because you don't necessarily yeah. you know something's very wrong with this character yes. So yes for someone else to be watching that i was feeling really effing sorry for that kid for that character you're, you're, you're supposed to there's a oh richie yeah 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 after, richie when, when they go to the peep tent you see the monster walking away from the peep tent yeah. And I think it's Buzz who actually articulates and says, I guess, I guess even Frankenstein has to get his jollies off. <laughs> so, so yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. There's, That's a great. So there's did, actually did, a reference. Yeah, to it. I was very, I, the, the dreamscape in this movie was so carefully choreographed. There, there was no fluff in it. I just, I really wanted the audience to, and, and, then, and then the audience is guilty of the voyeurism. 
two times that, you know, they, they cut a hole in the back of the tent because they don't want to pay money to go in. And besides, you have to be 21 to go see that. Yeah. Uh, which, by the way, sets up the fact that, gee, Buzz has got a switchblade. What's going on? <laughs> Buzz is a tough guy. You know, he's not, he, just, he just doesn't talk about it. He's a tough guy. Yeah. Uh, but the voyeurism, I don't know any good horror movie that doesn't have a really healthy dose of voyeurism, including the whole concept behind the horror movie. Yeah. You're, you're watching a horror movie that's doing things that you're not going to do, that you would like to do, that you think about doing, what would happen in this situation. But, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an escape valve for our darkest, you know, fantasies and nightmares. So it's yeah. filled with voyeurism from the, from the very beginning. Yeah. But I didn't, the biggest compliment I can give yourself and Tobe, yourself mainly, is I didn't hate the, I believed in these characters. I, I didn't hate the teenagers. I know it's, I keep, keep going back to that, but yeah. throughout the film, I'm like, oh, like I love Christine, John Carpenter's Christine, but there's something about the main, the main kid in it. Maybe it's the performance or something like that that's really irritating, but then it could, you know, changes, develops, turns dark towards the end. And it's, that's the point. But in this, I thought it was everyone kind of, everyone pretty much stuck together in terms of like they, they liked each other and, and, and they, they reacted to things the same way. It was, uh, yeah, I thought it was great. And, <laughs> It, when it, uh, it, when um, when when they think the creature's coming towards them on the uh, uh, funhouse train and they use the use the axe, I thought that was hilarious. That was absolutely hilarious, and it's actually their friend. He, obviously, he's already dead, but yes, he is. But pe people don't even don't, people don't even remember that when reviewers talk about it. Yeah, that was one of the most insidious scenes that I wrote, and I'm very yeah. I, I, I'm very proud of it because was there because... ever a point where in that particular scene, that the that character was still alive, and then then they kill him. No, he he he. No, they they're, they're not. People think that's the case, just like people make the assumption that uh, the monster uh, uh, takes Liz and rams her head into the uh, in, into the fan blades, which he does. He doesn't do. He, he more, doesn't. He more, that's too he, obvious, isn't it? Well, I, I I wouldn't do it. I'm thinking people are going to think he's doing it. I don't like those scenes. They don't they don't look particularly good. And, no, uh, and for no. me, for me, I think what it's like, uh, he's, I almost like the werewolf claws and the way he's like striking her. There's something. Oh, you, you, you see the hand come up, you see yeah. the blood. This there's was a, again. There's it, a, it, um, there's a film, I can't, oh, what's the title of this film? There's a Kate Hudson, Casey Affleck and Jessica Alba film. Can't remember oh. the title of it. He's a sheriff. Casey oh yeah, Affleck. yeah, yeah, yeah! It's a, and it's, it's a got brutal, something, it's a brutal, something me. It's one of the most brutal things I've ever seen in the film. You know the beating. You know, you know exactly what I mean. Um, it's based on a famous novel, by the way. And I, I think the beating of women in particular, especially on screen, it there's something you know you just can't get away from that. And I think it was too obvious for the fan. It looked, it was a great setup. The location was, you know, they kind of set up for it. It was fantastic, and. I loved how she saw him early on when he came around the corner in the pipes. And it wasn't like she saw him last second and then there's a scream. It, it, no, 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 no. It was, it's uh, slow. And she was getting very close to him. And, you know, all the characters are relatively brave as well, I think. And it's great. They're not just screaming. Obviously, there's a lot of screams in it. And there's, yeah, there's a lot of likability, in, in, I'd say, in the entire film with the characters. Uh, but that scene, that scene where they're watching him with uh, paying the money, and he, oh, what's, right, really good, what's, what's really got the performance and in your writing is that I honestly, obviously this is the point, but you feel so sorry for him and when he's counting the money, or not counting the money, and each time it's like, oh, he's really getting taken advantage of here. Uh, it's, it's, that's the darkest thing in the film is the kind of manipulation of him do you know what I mean? Like getting pushed well, to, the, I need you to do this one last thing for us. I need to go and basically kill the kids. Well, the father, yeah, this is what the, the history behind that was. It was, was that uh, uh, Kevin Conway, who we were so fortunate to get. And I, I feel so bad that he passed away this year because he, he was a absolutely brilliant actor. 
he came up with the idea. He said, I'm only going to do this movie if I can play all three Barkers. Okay, and it's a great idea, and Toby went for it, and it, it, it was absolutely brilliant. But he also, when, this is when I was in pre-production, he's asking for, I, I would just like to have one more scene. I, I just give me another scene between me and the kid. And I remember, because I, mean, I was in a hotel room, and, you know, I used to, you know, I think they, they, didn't, they didn't do, there's a very funny limo st story about this, but I, I was get, getting to the set, which was a, a little tiny studio that we did with it. Ivan Tour Studios, where they, where they, I think it's called Norin Studios, where they shot Flipper. Um, but he says, I, I, I just need one, I need another scene. So I, I, you know, again, this is very steeped in taboos and, and, and religion and lying. So I, I said, well, let's, let's just, let's do a, let's make it look like a confession booth. Let's make it be where the father is imploring the kid, like the kid, it's in confess. It looks, it looks like confession, you know, uh, where the where the, 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 the you know the monster is 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 like ashamed of what's going on in the father. Isn't he standing says, in the corner of the room? Yeah, it, but it looks like they even have some icons, yeah. you know, in, in the background there. It's, it's a corn thing or something, like a corn husk doll or something. Where he says, just do this one more bad thing. One more bad thing, and then afterwards, and I, this is like, I think it's my funniest line in the movie because he says it sincerely. He says, and afterwards, I'll take you fishing or anything you want. The, the oh, idea of a it, Yeah, it's, it's that kind of family bond of father and son or whatever. And you know. just picture them going fishing. It's like yeah. the, the trout's hanging out of the kid's mouth. But yeah. it's a highly dysfunctional family. Which is Toby Hooper stuff. But I have him, you know, saying, I have him saying, and again, I, I, I'm so proud of a line where he says, and I don't hate the sound, as God is my witness. I'm, I'm, I'm quoting Gone with the Wind, actually. <laughs> as God is my witness, you know, I don't hate the sound of your voice. They, they make up, you know, he makes up because he says, I can't stand the sound of your filthy voice. And he smacks him, in the, you know, in, yeah. in, or, earlier in the scene. So, again, the whole key to this, and, and uh, this is what, by the way, parenthetically, why I love Dan O'Bannon's Return of the Living Dead, and I go, I go to a great length in terms of speaking that about this. That was great, by the way. We'll talk about uh, that in just a sec, yeah. Okay. The key to good horror movies, and I think maybe what you liked about these characters, yeah. everybody believed in what they were saying and doing. There is no tongue in cheek, and when you see tongue in cheek in a horror movie, it the, the, it, kill, it kills the movie. And yeah. one of the tells you can get from this when people say after a movie is over that when the when the cast and the crew say we had such a good time making this movie, and they show you all these like really funny outtakes where everybody's like laughing and everything. T to me, it, it it it's you, you just missed the you missed the whole point. Every character believes it is total total integrity and i think across the board any good horror movie no matter how outrageous the character is marco he's an outrageous character marco the magnificent in this bill finley believes that he's a showman and he's going to scare the shit out of the audience and he delivers a stellar performance yeah. every character needs to do this in That's one of the, when I saw the, um, what was it I watched? It was a clip of the, outs, the um, him standing outside the fun house talking about coming in and enjoying it or reacting to it. The, if you watch that on its own, all the lines of dialogue of what he does, yeah. it's really sinister. <laughs> it's really sinister. And he's like, yeah, come in. And like, it's so, it's really dark. Obviously you've got the context of all this, the fun and, Coke and the shy or whatever it is. Well, this, this is the Barker's relationship with Amy, which is, which is very extraordinary, yeah. which when, which when Dean Koontz did the novelization of it, he did, he did backstories that, that didn't have them just metaphorically be linked. I have the metaphorically linked in the movie. Yeah. The beginning of the movie, it's, it said the bride of Frankenstein. So you know that Amy is going to wind up as that's going to be her future. Yeah. When, 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 when Madame Zena reads her palm, 
she says a tall dark stranger is going to enter and change your life okay <laughs> what do you think she's talking about she's talking about the monster at the end of the movie so i'm i'm trying to do it in a in a in a subtle way but in a way that you know when you see yeah. it on a second viewing that it, that, 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 it, that it all makes sense so similarly the barker who's playing three you know kevin conway is playing three different roles in the movie there is a bond he singles her out he knows there is something different about her yep. there's something that's going to happen madame zena singles her out and because she's saying are you psychic or you know do you have premonitions that often come true so it's all taken very seriously and by the way to me one of the funniest scenes in the movie is the juxtaposition of that very intense scene where the kids are laughing in the background and Richie grabs like his wallet and he has to jam it in his mouth yeah. to stop from laughing. Yeah. Which is you, you know which which you know which is what kid what happens kids laugh inappropriately after they've gotten stoned and they yeah. can't they can't control themselves. You know. Yeah. Uh and who came up with the um the design for the monster this is really interesting because Rick Baker was first signed on to do it. Rick Baker designed it. I described the monster as being troll-like with glowing eyes. Um, he had a, a movement that, that was very strange. Like he could creep up on you very, very quickly. Um, I only thought about it recently when I did an interview that what Toby wanted to do, because we spoke about this, you know, one on one, he wanted to figure out a way that the thing could be moving slow and fast at the same time. And we weren't, we, we got Wayne Dober to do it. He, 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 he does great. But I think the thing that Toby wanted was in the action sequences, what they did in 28 days later, where they do that, like that moat, that crazy motion. Yeah, where, yeah, yeah. where, where, and that hadn't that hadn't been invented yet. But he was described as being troll-like, with white hair and like a, a split a split face that resembles you know the split cow, which is which is in the movie, and and that there was a fetus in a bottle that also had a split face, which yeah. so they dubbed, they dubbed Gunther the uh, the cow man. Uh, but that's what I I wanted. I wanted him to be very troll-like. And I also wanted him to be at the end of the movie. He he's tracking Amy down by smell, which is to me is, hor is, is horrific. It's like an animal, you know, yeah. more like an animal sniffing somebody out because he had sort of like in, in, imprinted on her. By the way, just very quickly, there was a, a huge chase scene that was supposed to take around eight minutes after Buzz is killed of Amy being stalked by the monster, Gunther. And he's following her as she's running. Now, he doesn't really want to kill her. He, he, he's, we, we, don't, we don't know this at this point. She's running for dear life. But she's already hallucinating because this has gotten, she just saw Buzz was killed. She she's, runs. She just sees, she, she, she sees Liz's body. And, you know, she's being stalked. And I wanted to, at that point, really like on acid where just imagine the fun house all those figures now you're on acid where there's like starting to move and all this stuff and i had her in the script at one point running headlong into one of the ceramic figures and it cracks it falls over and cracks open and there's the remains of a human being in that which means that that some of these figures that are in you know that are in the fun house are actually were plastered over human beings because they had done this before. They, they he makes references to you know what in Memphis you know with, with those, those yeah little, those, yeah yeah, yeah. Two, and again there was an yeah, earlier yeah that's where, that's quite early on that reference isn't it the witch the witch the reference to something happening to kids at a carnival they they oh they mention it very on in the beginning of the movie the parents say I, we don't want you going because something happened when yeah, it went through right, the, yeah. the, the yeah. previous time so you're all set up for, for it being a real cautionary tale but i i had had an earlier scene where you actually see a, a body which you think is a body uh, uh you think it's a, it's a mannequin being buried and it's actually it, it, it's 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 there's a, the remains of a person in this so that 
when this was all over, if you went through that fun house, you were going to find a lot of bodies, which, you know, which were, <laughs> which were basically used in this fashion. By the way, I also had it where he doesn't, he doesn't die at the end. He resurrects at the end of the movie. Uh, he, and the way I did it was, I mean, you, 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 you can see it. It's obvious from, it's obvious from the script. Um, she stumbles out of the fun house. Now people say, well, how did he get, how did she get out? Why didn't she get out earlier? Well, because the whole place disintegrates and falls apart when the chains go crazy at the end at the bottom. You see timbers like coming down and that's how, that's how she's able to get out. But I had a scene inserted in between her getting out yep. and wandering around and you can see Marco the Magnificent and his daughter Carmela are, are actually there and you can see the geek you know, who like grabs onto her clothing and you can see, you know, God is watching you lady. She's there too. I had an actual scene where then you go back into the fun house and all of a sudden you hear like a creaking and a chain snaps and it releases the monster who, even though he had all these wounds on him, starts coming back to life. And then because the chain started up again, you have the funhouse lady at the end laughing, and that's the reason why she starts laughing, and then it it, it slows down because because the, the chains have done. So that I had, been had interesting him, to see. Yeah, that would be interesting. I had him resurrected at the end of the movie because I wanted to do a freaking sequel. Yeah, I think it would have worked, really worked as well. Um, I, I, I I was I was just thinking about that kind of uh, the ending scene with the with the monster. I just think it, it's a very classic. If you watch it, you could that'd be a great scene in black and white because it feels like a very like early twenties kind of death to a monster. There's something very classic about those huge cogs, the monster, yeah. the 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 kind of It's like Frank movie. like the movie Frankenstein. One of the Frankenstein yeah. movies that got the cog wheels in the windmill that powers the whole yeah. thing. That's what I loved about that scene is is it's like it was just the way he was like pressed into it. You could, you could see that was going to happen, but it was like, it was, and was she trying to save him or just get away from him when she's pulling well, away? This, this, this is, this is the whole thing that, um, I, th I, I think, I think there's a part of her that, you know, that, that was feeling bad for him at this point, but, yeah. but it's, it's just something, by the way, um, one of the things I remember Toby telling me is Elizabeth Barrett, when she was scared out of her, she was like <laughs> genuinely petrified during this movie. And she's screaming, and Toby tells me this, right? Because I'm in the editing room with him, okay? Yeah. They, they, when, they, when they're editing at Universal Studios, I'm in the editing room with him. They left, out a, they, left, they left out all the brilliant editors. They left out the scene of when the parents uh, come to pick up Joey. What's wrong, Joey? What's wrong, Joey? They left out the scene, but it's in the movie now because I told the editor, would you please put it back in there? It's where, she, where, where she says, I'm gonna get you even with you so bad, you're never gonna, you're, you're never gonna you know, uh, forget it. And that's yeah. the reason why he ironically doesn't tell his parents that she's in there. That's the real reason for it. But, uh, uh, I just lost my trend of thought. What was that's a what? really good? That's a really good scene uh, in terms of the way that relationship between the sister and the brother, and they no, don't see they don't see each other again, do they? She obviously he, the kid sees the sister going in, but they don't. He 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 doesn't he doesn't what he called he could he could tell his parents that Amy is is in the thing. She's screaming, "Mommy!" You know, she's screaming, "Daddy, Daddy, Daddy!" Not mom yeah. because mommy's a freaking alcoholic. Yeah. And 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 he the, the kid clams up. Now you don't know if the kid is clamming up because he's traumatized, but when you put in that sound, which they did, which I'm going to get even with you so bad that you're never going to forget what this is going to happen. That adds to his trauma. So he says nothing, and then and then they uh, you know they they drive away, and they and they and they leave her uh, on, on, on her own. But oh yeah, so I was going to say. So Amy, throughout the entire movie, and Toby, we're in, the, we're in the editing room, we're doing this, he goes, God bless her, she was amazing. But, you know, she's like saying, oh my God, oh my God, through the entire last scene, she's going, oh my God, oh my God. And if you look very carefully, if you look at it like in Blu-ray, you know, or you project it on a big screen, yeah. you can, a lot of times you can see that she's going, 
and they just got rid of it because it, it was too much. It, 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 <laughs> it, 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 it became annoying. But I, I never forget Toby saying it. She said, oh my, he gives me a falsetto voice. Oh my God, oh my God. How many times can she say that? You know, so they, yeah. they uh, but she was great. She, she, they they were all such good sports. They you can see that you can you can see it when actors are believing the material, especially you know. I think, uh, and it's I'm gonna highly recommend it, especially for our festival. I'm gonna highly recommend the film, and I think uh, um, a mutual friend of ours on Instagram he's gonna do a review for us. So I think it's fantastic, and it's very lean. There's 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 no fat in it at all. I don't think. And um, yeah. Wayne, Wayne, Do- Wayne Double was absolutely brilliant. No, so you you asked me, I'm sorry, about the uh, the, the mask and how it came about. Yes, yes. So uh, Rick Baker designed it. He designed it and came up with the cow man and the split face and all this. And then Craig Reardon uh, actually executed it. And uh, Fantastic. But, you know, it, it, what's interesting is, is that I met Rick, Rick Baker and then I saw him again at the screening. And he was absolutely fantastic. He was great. He was the guy was has been a genius for so many years. I can't tell you, and he continues yeah. to be. Yeah, uh, he's, uh, he's 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 basically re- self self imposed retirement now after his experience he, on the Wolfman, I believe. He, he he talks he talks about it, but I I don't I don't I don't think I don't think real horror movie people ever really do this. Um, there are stories of people who say, I've had enough, I want to retire. Doug Trumbo had enough of it after, after he did a Brainstorm and it broke his heart. The, the, the director, I, I mean, the, the special effects guy, Doug Trumbo. Yeah, did, genius, did, uh, genius. Yeah, but well, that was his first movie. And that like that broke him. He never, he, he, he never wanted to direct another film again. I, I, I think he actually did wind up doing something. But I think, anyway, so Craig Reardon uh, actually... You know, if I if I if I bump into Craig Reardon, uh, I, I was hoping to do this when they do monster when they had Monster Palooza here, yeah. uh, which was canceled because of COVID. But uh, he actually, <laughs> uh, in print, he said he didn't like the script, <laughs> and, I, and I I mean I I mean I would forgive him obviously, but that's something that I'm like really I was really very disappointed in that someone that someone would say that, uh, but. Uh, um, it's a, very, it's a very specific thing that as well like i would say oh, i'm not i'm not a huge fan of the film if you were, you know what i mean that's the kind of more polite way to go about it i think anyway uh but uh it it was it, it was it was it was an amazing part of my life and uh yeah. and uh and then there was the book that was like even a bigger miracle for me the, the dean yeah. Koontz book which was the novelization by dean Koontz. uh I made more money on the on, on my piece of the book than I did on the movie. That is quite a quite a stellar writer to have do that. Well, D, it was early in Dean's career, and he was under, writing under the name of Owen West. And Universal Studios came forward and basically said, uh, uh, "We're going to novelize this because it was a little trendy to do to, to do that at that time." Yeah. Um, and. Uh, and of course, me being the right. Oh, can I do? No, no, no. We already have some. We already have someone. Uh, we got this guy named Owen West, and we're going to launch as the new Stephen King. We're giving him a three book deal, and uh, and no one knew that it was Dean Koontz. And they paid him a lot of money to do the novelization. He called me up. I spoke with him one time, and he said, uh, "Larry, this is Owen West. Uh, I, I've been tasked with in doing a novelization of your script. I love your script." Uh, you know, it, I'm going to do backstories uh, and, and like really flesh it out and, 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 and put a lot of meat, backstory meat on it. Uh, is there anything you want to tell me that, that, you know, that's not in the script? And my response was, no, no, the script kind of like speaks for itself. Good luck to you. And that was it. He came up with all these background stories and, 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 uh, and the mother being a little bit like in Carrie and being, you know, a devout uh, a holy roller Christian who uh, was, was was a screwball. Uh, and uh, and then the backstory of, of, of the Barker getting even with, if you know, if you know the book, 
it, it's all backstory and Amy is there for a reason. It's fate. And the Barker is getting even with her because she's the, it, it's very complicated. That's cool. brilliant. I'll, have to, I'll very, have to read that. Yeah. Oh no, you'll, you'll be amazed because the, 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 the last, 20% of the book is the movie. The first 80% is all, okay. is, is all, is, is, is all, is all backstory. That's great. That's, I, love, uh, I love that setup. That's great. He, 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 he did an extraordinary job. And then, uh, then the book came out and the book was delayed that you can, you can, if you get the latest version of Dean Kutz's, uh, the fun house, the last uh, five years ago, they reissued it again. Uh, in the afterward, he speaks all about me. We became like really best friends because what happened was, is that when they first released the book, my deal was I had three points. There were five points to be divided up between the producers and myself. And I was very stubborn and basically demanded the three, three out of the five points. I got my three points and the, the movie was delayed. The book came out earlier. It was supposed to come out simultaneously. Yeah. And the book went number two on the New York Times bestseller and sold like two, two million copies. So I had, th I had three points in that, which, and, 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 and in the book business, unlike the movie business, points in the, in the movie business mean nothing. You'll, you'll never see profits unless they're off the gross. You'll never see profits because a movie has to make three times the amount of money that it made. So uh, it was off the cover price. So I, you know, I, I got a huge advance on the book. It was That's great. great. And then years later, like 10 years later, Dean announces himself as I mean, and Owen West. It turns out is Dean Koontz, who had already was, a, was an established brand of being as big as Stephen. Oh, Zane. so then you had another huge they piece. They had to come to me and they had to say, okay, well, those points don't exist anymore because it's a republication. So we can give you maybe, uh, you know, a half a point or one point. And I, I, this was like, to me is a miracle, but what is this difference between I'm supposed to get three and they're offering me a half or one. So I call up Dean's agent who I had only I'd spoken to. I didn't even know the agent. Yeah. And said, listen, this is Larry Block. I, I, could you just do me a favor and have Dean give me a call? I only spoke to him once when he was Owen West. And I, was, I, I didn't think he'd call me back. And he calls me back within like two hours. And he goes, let's go. Hey, Larry, how you doing? What's going on? And I'm thinking to myself, my gosh, you've become so famous. And you know, I goes, well, Universal is republishing the book. He goes, yeah, that's right. I says, and well, they're telling me they can give me a half a point or one point. He goes, no, 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 no. I'm not letting them do this to you. They are ripping you off so badly. You, you listen. The, the 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 complete number of three points don't exist anymore. But you should be able to get two and a half points. And I'm going to tell you how to do it. Here's what you're going to do. I'm giving you a half a point out of my pocket. I couldn't believe it. It was basically like handing me thirty, forty thousand dollars. Yeah. I, I couldn't believe it. He says you're going to go to Mace Newfeld, the producer, and you're going to you're going to tell Mace that you know why he's got to cough up a half a point. Because it, 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 you just just hang tough. I don't care how you do it, hang tough. And then you're going to have the hardest deal of all, which is with Universal Publishing, you know, the, the Jove Books. They're going to threaten you. They're going to tell you they're not going to release the book, which is what they did. They said, you, you know, we won't release the book. You, you, you're being too selfish. You know, you're being too greedy. You don't deserve it. You didn't do anything. And... Uh, but you're going to hang tough. And he goes and get yourself a lawyer and, and, and just hang tough. And every time you feel weak, give me a call and I'll give you a pep talk to get you through this. So they, and he That's talks incredible. About That's incredible to no, be there he, as that, he, pep, for that pep talk as well. I couldn't believe it. This, this guy was like, an, like a guardian angel sent by God. I, I'm, I'm being hundred percent serious. Yeah. Uh, and so as it played out, you know, Universal, it's, it's the book division. It's not the movie division. It's the book division yeah. is threatening me and telling me you will never work in this town again. You, 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 we're not giving that half a point. The Dean is telling me they will, because otherwise they don't have a right to publish the book and it's already ready for publication. So just hang tough. I hang tough. They give me the two and a half points. They're really pissed off at me. I think Universal is upset with me as well. And, um, uh, I get my first check and this, I was broke at the time. I get my first check for the advance on Dean Koontz's. My name is not on the cover. It's under the copyright because they wanted to sell more books and that's legitimate that they would sell more books if it said, yeah, you know, yeah that's understandable. Yeah. And I, I, my first check 
was $119,000. And it just blew my mind. I couldn't believe it. Uh, and it was great. We became very close friends. I've worked on several projects with him. I did a, I did a, I, I, I set him up at, at, at one place with a deal at, at, uh, at one of the at star studio. Uh, uh, I had rights to a whole bunch of his books uh, over the years. Uh, the guy trusts me. He's like a brother to me. And, and I, I love the guy. We speak frequently. Uh, we, it, it's great That's having great. him as like, as having was great. And if you get the, you know, the, the last republication, uh, of, of the fun house, which is probably five years ago. In the afterward, he talks very complimentary about me, about being his, his half, his half Jewish brother in, in, <laughs> in, 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 Los, in, in Los Angeles, because we have lots of religious debates and it's very fascinating. Yeah, 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 absolutely. He's, like a That's very, great. He, he's a very high, what I call a very high IQ Catholic, like Graham Greene was a very high IQ Catholic. And I yeah. loved Graham, reading Graham Greene. Yeah, I've got a I've got a, a quad poster which is the UK sized, which is thirty by forty inches of the uh I think it was the fortieth fortieth anniversary of the third man and uh Oh wow, wow I've got wow, I've got wow. that somewhere. So I I had that framed locally in Chester where I'm from in the northwest of the UK. And I had offers, I had five offers to buy the it wasn't an original from the fort from forty nine. It was um it was the reissue, but it's it's black and white with the kind of, I think it's yellow and red text with uh, Graham Green and Joseph Cotton and obviously Wells. And uh, I had offers and I said, I, I said, basically, I want £2,000 for it. I knew I wouldn't get it, but there was, there was offer of, you know, I love, I'm a huge poster collector. I used to, I used to buy them all the time. I've got, nice. I've got a, a Carpenter originals. I've got uh, a couple of Hitchcock bus stop posters from his last cut two films. I'm a yeah, massive poster collector and uh, yeah, Graham Greene, uh, yeah, a, a brilliant, brilliant writer. And I can imagine those debates you have with Dean Kuntz is, uh, is kind of part of the connection why he feels so close to you as well and why you've become so uh, such good friends over the years. Well, it, it's a very, I mean, it, it, in America right now, the religion thing is not, is not very, is, I think we're one of the few last religious countries that in the world, actually, believe it or not, yeah. uh, where there's a lot of people, but, but um, it, 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 it's, 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 it's fascinating. It's absolutely fascinating. Uh, and again, every horror movie, there is, no, I, will, I will bet you, that it, no horror movie exists that's any good that doesn't have at its foundation Judeo-Christian belief systems of, in, in, in taboos and morality and payback time and, you know, what goes around comes around and karma. Yeah. These are all religious principles that play, that this is what, this is what, this is the engine that powers horror movies. It's oh, absolutely, that, yeah. It's the engine that powers uh, uh, Hansel and Gretel and all and all and all the dark, you know, uh, cautionary tales. It's yeah. the engine that that you know that 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 uh, that that runs uh, mythology, Oedipus, I mean, the whole the, all of literature. Absolutely, the strongest the strongest material is is kind of born out of all of that. Because because it's by the way, it's all Jungian. It's 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 ba it's baked. Yeah, even, you know, it's, in Freud, your, it's in our yeah. DNA. It's in our DNA. Yeah. Absolutely. And and uh, and when it works, when, when it works, when in a movie, when, when the audience is saying, "Don't do that! Don't do that! Don't do that!" You know, it's going to happen. Don't don't do it. And they do it. You you know that this, this is what this is why people become emotional. Yeah. I I went to a screening of, of I went to a lot of screenings of Fun House. It gets very depressing when. When the movie has had its run and it's finished, it was like finished after like around three or four weeks. Um, I have a recording someplace. I brought a digital record. I mean, it was a tape recorder and actually a little mini one of one of the recordings. But there's nothing like it in the world. When you hear audiences verbalizing, don't do it, don't do it. Or I can't watch, I can't watch. It, it, it's it must so be an amazing... Um feeling as a writer to hear that it, it's an it's a it's a major adrenaline rush and yeah. uh when you're part of that when you're part of that as an audience member it's great but i can't imagine what it's like for a screenwriter it, it's it's 
it, the, the downside of this is, is that um, one out of every hundred screenplays actually gets made into a movie. Now maybe that that's changing. Right. Maybe that's maybe that's changing with with you know with uh, with streaming services because I don't think they spend money anymore unless they're actually going to make something. Uh, but in terms Sounds of the right, yeah. in in terms of the studio system, I was at Paramount for like three months. I had a nice office because I sold the project to Eddie Murphy, and uh, they have vaults filled with thousands of screenplays that they pay good money for. And uh, they never got made. And during the right WGA strikes, we had two major big strikes that went on forever. Oh yeah. I, I think that's when the that's when Hollywood finally got smart and learned to stop to stop buying all these spec screenplays up because they stockpiled screenplays prior to each one of the strikes. They bought thousands of screenplays in anticipation of a strike, and then you're going to have a strike. You can't buy any more screenplays. And they got no value for their money whatsoever. So the ratio has always been around one out of a hundred. Yeah. Um, so when you're fortunate enough to have a feature made, and it, it's kind of it's 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 a, it's a miracle to have this happen. I yeah. had it happen a, a couple of times, uh, but there's nothing like it. There's nothing like it in the entire world. It, it is an unbelievable feeling. And the only downside of that is is that when you're selling scripts and they're paying you good option money and then the movies are not getting made, the majority of, of, of writers in the writers go don't have features that are made. Uh, they can, you can make a very comfortable living selling screenplays that are just, that just sit and go through development deals forever. Uh, and then they bring other writers on. You still got paid that money for the option. I, was um, re I, I read a story. It was in the Gorilla, I think it was the Gorilla Filmmaker's Handbook years ago. And it was about Quick and the Dead the screenwriter that sold that, I think it was a Sam Raimi film with Russell Crowe. There's a, there's a magnificent cast in it. I'm not a big fan of the film, but the screenplay was sold for, it was a spec script and it was like $2 million or something yeah, like well, that. They, they, it was they, crazy. They, they, it was crazy. Absolutely crazy. They, 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 they were doing this. And again, this was a thing where they would announce the numbers and everybody would be so excited. But then you realize these movies are not being made. Some movies, I mean, if you look at the history of them, they're 10, they're, they're 10 years in the making, they're 12 years in the making. Yeah. Um, and then there, there's some book, it's a great book about the great movies that were never made, and it yeah. lists a whole bunch of them, and yet some of them actually, since that book was published, actually did get made. But uh, it, it, it's, 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 it's fascinating, and it really it's the is, one... Yeah. It's the one downside of being a screenplay, a screen, a screenwriter, as opposed to being like a novelist or a short story writer or a poet, even, because what you learn there, when when you're a novelist, uh, you can show your novel to people and and, and they can read. It. You write a short story, oh, you, you want to read my short story? People, oh, that's great, I love it, I love it, because everybody can read novels and short stories and poems. But screenplays are a very different kind of a format. It's not even like a play play. Uh, and you know so that one of the it was a it was a relatively clever move. But um, when J.K. Rowling released the screenplay or the play for uh, Cursed Child, I think it was the sequel to the Harry Potter series. I think it's the sequel. It was for the stage play that was massively successful, and. That's probably the most read screenplay because that's what it is. It, it's the they just put it into a book and they release that. So it was that's it's a real insight into it. Obviously, so many people have never read a screenplay before in in the formatting, uh, but that was quite an interesting move. Obviously, by uh, Jordan, Jordan Peele did, did this with uh, with Get Out. It's, yeah, it's it on makes Amazon. complete sense. Yeah. I'll have to check that out. Yeah. And and I and I think I might have mentioned to you one of my dreams is and now that I own the rights to the fun I, I, not through the Writers Guild but you know because you you do to a certain extent anyway but because through copyright you took it was a three year process I own the rights to the fun house yeah that's and, well, that's what I want to ask you about as well is that um, and before before we continue on that I'd like to if we can kind of if we stick with the fun house I'd like to chat again about some of the other projects of the work and i'll be i think that'll be really good to do 
two or three okay. episodes. I think that'd be great fun. So yeah, you've, um, how did you get the rights back and what was the reasoning behind that? Okay, so uh, there's, a, there's a copyright rule which talks about recapture that the, I think it went to federal court where it was, it was pretty damn obvious that when, that when 30 years ago, 40 years ago, when people were giving up their copyright in the arts, meaning novels, screenplays, songs, that nobody understood what the value was going to be in the future markets where they would have streaming services and, and, you know, and uh, they would have MP3s of music. Nobody, Ray Charles family, his estate never had any concept that, that this would go on forever and that they would do remasterings. Yeah. So, uh, and same with movies. So they did a thing that was called copyright recapture and uh, where if you put an organization on notice, the, the, the people who own your copyright, that you want it back, they have three years to contest it or make a deal with you to make them have it in perpetuity. How, uh, how long do you have to wait before you can start that three-year process? Uh, I, 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 be, I, believe it, I believe it. The magic number for me was like 79, 80, and 81. So there was a, there's a famous, there's a famous um, uh, uh, attorney, Mark Toberoff, who specializes in this. Yeah, he's waiting and, for things to tick, yeah. Yeah, he, he got back to, for Ray Charles's family. He got, he, he got, I believe it was Ray Charles. He got back the, the music rights for his estate. Wow. He got back, he got back the, novel, the, the novel rights for the Alex Haley uh, estate, which is why you saw a remake that was done on, uh, for cable of, of Roots. He recaptured the rights uh, on Piranha, which was originally a Roger Corman $400,000, $500,000 movie. Uh, I, I believe it was an Asian woman who owned the rights. He got the rights back for her. They turned it into a $20 million a 3D oh, movie, yeah, with, yeah. Which, which had Richard Dreyfuss in yeah, the introduction. Great, great cameo, it. yeah. No, and, and it, had a, it had Elizabeth Shue was in it. It had a real cast. Listen, it's a, it's a piece of exploitation, but it's a great it's a prop, film. It's a proper movie, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a legitimate movie, and, and, it, and it, it, did, it did very well. It did really yeah, the re well. The reason I watched it was because I saw, oh, Richard Dreyfuss is coming in. I've got to watch this now. <laughs> well, they were very smart. He, he, yeah. he, co he also co-produced the movie because he set the deal up. Anyway, he approached me and because he was going through like a whole catalog of, of, of 79, 80, 81 horror movies, which were ripe for this, you know, for, for this copyright recap. So did he, re did he approach you or did you kind of mutually find each other? No, no, no. He approached me. He called me, he called me up and said, is this Larry Bach who wrote The Fun House? I've been trying to find you. I said, yes. He says, well, I have an interesting, you know, proposition for you if, you, if you're interested in doing recapture. And, you know, we, it, it, the negotiations took a very long time because he wanted, you know, what most attorneys want when they're going to work, you know, uh, 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 basically uh, uh, on an if-come basis. Uh, but I worked out a super deal with him, and he was a real gentleman, where, because he likes to produce these movies as well. And uh, so he gets 40%. That's a, great, of, that's a great way, for obviously for him, that's a great way to become a producer, I guess, is to... Well, he's done, and, he, and he's a producer on all, his, on all those movies and recaptures, and... So I made a deal with him, you know, and my, my personal attorney said he couldn't believe I made this deal where, okay, so he can get 40% of my literary rights, but I get 40% of his producing rights because he gets much bigger producing rights than I ever get. So it's almost like we're 50, 50 partners in this venture. I see. Yeah. And, so, uh, but it, see it. so what, what do you want to happen next? I don't know. I'm, I'm so, there's a, I'm, I'm kind of like, so the first thing I really want to do, which has got nothing to do with, with, with a movie is I want to do a coffee table book the way Jordan Peele did it. But I want to have real, I want to go to Universal Studios, get the rights to be able to do a, a collaboration of, uh, of the shooting script, the original screenplay, the, 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 the second original screenplay that was, that was done for yeah. Universal and put it all together in this huge, magnificent book with the history of the movie, The Fun House. And I, I, I just got, think- um, people... would, you, would Universal or the, who, who would have them, production designer, 
the original boards for it? Would you have the boards for it? Because it's obviously a very well shot film. They have every. They have. They have. They have everything. You, every, everything you could want to imagine. I'm assuming that they actually have those titles still. Yeah. They, they have the blood. That would make from- a great. That would be a great section for the for the for the for the, for the book, and talking about the production of the titles and everything. There's so much to it. No, I would, I, I, I would love to do this. By the way, I'm convinced to this day because I was accessible. I'm a lifetime member of the Writers Guild. Anybody could have gotten in touch with me at any time, just through the Writers Guild. Uh, that uh, I'm, I'm convinced that the reason why I was left off the, the Blu-ray and the DVD was because they were well, in terms of, I, in, Sorry, that, before sorry, I cut you off, but uh, left off what being interviewed. I, w- I wasn't interviewed on the DVD or the Blu-ray. Yeah, I know more about the I know more about the Funhouse. You know, I, I my memory was better than Toby's. What do you think the reasoning? What do you think the reasoning of that is? I think the reasoning is they were very. I think the producers and everybody involved it was very upset that I wound up with a very large percentage of the money from the uh, from the book from the Dean Koontz book. I, over the years, I wound, I wound up with a, a, probably a quarter of a million dollars from the Dean Koontz book, and they got very little. And I think they're very upset about it, and they were very upset about it. Uh, but now that I have the rights to it, you, you, can't, you can't reissue the Blu-ray without going to me. Yeah. So, and I, 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 I want to see it come out in 4K. Uh, so anyway, I want to do a coffee table book. I want to, I want to do a sequel. Uh, Would you be up for a remake? Well, I want to do. I want to really. I really would like to do a remake because there were a lot of scenes that were left out, and I think that the 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 concept of the of the of the it it would have to be a period piece, because you know, and I there's there's a precedent for for, for this. I mean, it it could go on afterwards uh, in present time, but. but there were a lot of things that were left out. And, you know, and, and again, I, I'm most disappointed in the fact that that chase scene, Verna Fields came in, the, the editor, and we didn't have a chase scene. So she, it, it gives you the illusion of a chase scene. If you saw the movie you, you, where she's like running and all the statue, all, all the mannequins are like popping up and the lights are flashing and you see the gorilla going yeah, and swiping yeah. like this. and the, they, they gave the illusion of a chase scene, but it's not a real chase scene where she's really running more than 25 feet to get to the room where Liz is, where Liz's body is before she falls down. Yep. I had a chase. The Fun House had this incredible, I have the blueprints, by the way, to the Fun House. They could be, I have uh, the that's amazing. They, they could have utilized that whole, uh, obviously there's something, appealing of, of the monster in the castle so to speak but then yes. he, could, he could have used the entire uh, fair you know the whole we, so, so what was the original plan can you remind me what was the original plan for that chase okay what i had originally wanted to do was buzz is killed i was very surprised that buzz comes out on the statue which i had i was very surprised that there wasn't more blood it's just like a little, like a pool of blood, you know, showing through his shirt. I, I was very surprised that he, that it, that it wasn't, that it didn't look a lot worse. Yeah. I think they did it because he was a pretty sympathetic character at the end, because he was a hero at the end. And I don't think they wanted to show it really bad, but I'm like, was very surprised that they didn't show it at all. So she sees this, she totally freaks out. They do that great shot with the chandelier. It's just beautiful where the, the, the camera cranes down uh, and then she starts running yep. and then they give she was supposed to be running and being stalked he's supposed to be following her above you know the same there's, there's like a uh, the rack, a catwalk. So to speak yeah there's a, cat, there's a catwalk up there with trap we, we know there's trap doors because because Liz falls through a trap door we know there's there's a structure up there because a noose comes down and, 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 and yeah it hangs, exactly yeah uh, it's very phantom of the opera yeah yeah. So, so yeah, exactly. Which remind me, I also, I also have delusional ideas about doing this as a Broadway show, which is Phantom of the Opera meets, seriously, meets the Elephant Man, okay, <laughs> meets Sweeney Todd. 
it makes sense. When, it makes, it makes you, sense. When, yeah. When, when you change the whole, the whole, the whole theater becomes a carnival with so, selling stuff, with this selling stuff, and you know popcorn, and you're getting cotton candy, and you're watching this incredible show, which is an incredible, incredible. Yeah. Love, it's quite it's a immersive, love story. Like, yeah. So was it's the love, chase going to continue in the rafters? The chase was going to be she's running through the main floors of the fun house up the ramp because remember there's a ramp that goes yeah, up yeah, yeah. and there's a yeah. ramp that goes that you run through the gorilla's mouth it was a, it was a beautiful amazing set the, that set the, was a, great yeah it, this 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 was more Rabinowitz who you know who did Castle Keep and they shoot horses don't they which were all once giant set the guy was a genius and it, everything yeah, from it, scratch it's so efficient it's it's really well shot and. Those crane moves, uh, yeah, it was very, way. very, it was very cleverly, efficiently shot that film, yeah. It, it, and, and in a very short period of time. Anyway, I had her being stalked, yeah. you know, like, an, uh, like a, a re regular movie where you're being stalked through the woods, otherwise, but you're being stalked through the fun house. Yeah. And she's running in and out and, and you know, and, 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 and then while this is going on, she actually runs head on into one of the uh, one of the mannequins. Oh, you, it, you mentioned that before, yeah. And there's, yeah. there's a there's and a it body, cracks yeah. open. It, 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 you would because we're surreal at this time. It's like she's on acid, and it, it, I would have it actually like crack apart, like in stop motion almost, where she would see this, and then she takes off again, and the thing is getting closer and closer, and he's sniffing her out, and it, it's absolutely horrific until she winds up in the room where Liz is. Yeah. Where, and, and then at that point, she backs into the, into the uh, she recoils when he breaks through the door and, a, and you know, uh, a, what do you call it? There's a dresser drawer that breaks open and then you see that there's a, there's a way to get down to the bowels of the fun house. And then she's in the, where, where the equipment room is. If, that they had, if, they, if, that had been, if that had been included, you'd you'd say, oh yeah, it's more of a Tobe Hooper film now. You know what I mean? Well, it, it, you know what it was supposed to look like as I was a big fan? It was supposed to look like the, cha the end scene in Suspiria, mm, where yeah. she's running, she's running for her life through the, it's like maze yeah. uh, to get out. And things are exploding all around. I, I love that scene. I love, I love that movie, by the way. What great movie, yeah. Look, what, a great, what a beautiful looking movie. Uh, speaking about, you know, colors. Uh, uh, anyway, it was supposed to go on forever. And they did a great job of giving you the illusion of that chase. Yeah. But they didn't have that. And they didn't have the thing which would have taken it to a whole other level of, you realize that half of these mannequins have people under them. <laughs> it becomes yeah. so much more that's a, that's a th Exactly, yeah. That's a great, that would have been a great reveal as well. So I would do that. So I, I mean, I, I, I would like to do that. I mean, you could do this as a, as a, a self-contained, very long first act, which takes place then. Yeah. Okay. And then, and then jump 10, 20 years, uh, you know, uh, uh, late, 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 later. And I mean, I mean, you, you, there, there were so many possibilities. And then, of course, there was a possibility of doing a sequel just instead, or then there was doing it as a series, which would be so much fun. Uh, is the is the Blu-ray released by is it Arrow or Shout or one of those? Uh, those I believe I, be, I, be, I believe it's I believe it's it's I believe it's Shout. It's like Screen Factory, maybe or something like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. One yeah, of those. It is, it is, yeah, yeah, and, and 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 it's gorgeous. I contacted them and I said I would love to do a. Uh, when you guys are ready to do the 4K. You know, I'm a I'm the guy who wrote. I know more information about this movie than anyone. I mean, I've seen all. You need you need to put commentary on it. You've got to do a commentary for it. Well, this is what I wanted to do, and their response was, "We love this. We would love to do it, but we no longer have the rights to. to they, they don't. They no longer have the rights to do the uh, uh, to to, re, to to reissue the Blu-ray. They would have to purchase them again. Which right. you know, again, I, I, I'm. I'm I was very anxious about getting it done very quickly, and but I'm not so anxious anymore. I, I it, it's a real property. It's very. It's, uh, it's something to be very proud of, and I understand as we spoke briefly yesterday to set this up. Uh, it's something that, if it's done, you want it done right, and you want to be involved. And I can totally understand that. Oh no, no, and you know, and what, what happens in Hollywood is you just get this thing about, oh, you're sure that you want to really be the one that, that writes it or works on the story <laughs> for it. And, 
And that's that's the that's the insanity of Hollywood. I, I, I learned a very valuable lesson from Dean Koontz. He told me a story. He was at one of the major studios. I'm not going to name the studio. They invited him in for a meeting. They were going to make a whole bunch of movies, Dean Koontz movies. And they brought him in and they had a development meeting. And he tells me, so we're in the meeting and we're talking about the book and, and how I would do the adaptation because he, he's a screenwriter. He got, I mean, he got credits. I mean, he, his, his first... His first movie that was made was uh, was, was basically um, oh the, the uh, Julie Christie and the, and, and, and the, the robot falls in love with her in, in the smart house. You have to know this movie. She's she's raped but she's raped by the smart house in this movie. It's a very famous movie. You can look it up. I, I, it's I'm not Barbara her. Hershey. No 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 no. That's the one with the ghost rape. It's oh this, my this, god, that's got. I'm going to say this line that Barbara, I can't remember the title of the film. It's welcome home cunt on the end. Of, it's the last line of the movie. It's the, yeah, one of the most horrific things I've heard in a film. Like no, no. it's just so dark, you know? A a a anyway, so he's in a meeting and he's talking about the adaptation and one of the development executives is there and the president of the studio is there. And Dean says, well, I would do this. And then one of the development executives says, well, no, 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 no. This is like this is totally wrong. This is wrong. You know what you really need to do is you need to do this. Now they're talking to Dean Koontz. He had written twenty horror books at that time that were all best-selling books. And, <laughs> and, and, do, and do me a favor. Don't have don't have the audacity. He <laughs> said you're doing it wrong. What 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 are you, what are you like kidding me? What happens in Hollywood is after you're 40 years old, they really don't want to hear anything that comes out of your mouth. And, it, and it's very, very sad because in the world of novels, yeah. good novelists write up until their 80s and, you know, 80 years old, they're still writing yeah. great novels. I'm, uh, I'm for the Hellbound Horror Festival, which we're going to kind of launch this interview on, uh, we're, we're, one of our judges, uh, Ramsey Campbell, he's been writing for 60 years, 59 and a half years, something like that. He's, he writes uh, he writes every single day and he gets up at six in the morning. And yeah, to dismiss someone because of age, it's, it's completely ludicrous. If the content's there, the writing's there, and the, the ideas are there, then have at it. I, 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 just, I just think I find it very... Anyway, yeah, this is my baby. And... Uh... And again, there's there's a lot of stuff that was that, that that's in your. There, there are several drafts of the screenplay, including the original one, which got, uh, which by the way, I got I, I got it directly to Toby Hooper myself. Let me just, uh, if you have the time, just very quickly. Here's the real story, and I've seen interviews that, that Toby gave in his last years, where he has absolutely forgotten the real story. He knew the, the real story at one time okay. because he was there. He was part of it. But the real story is there was a company called Lady Gardner Laven Productions who had done a lot of TV, the Big Valley uh, uh, series that they ran a really long time. The Rifleman, they had done one horror movie called It Challenges the World, which was a black and white horror movie, which if you're a real fan of 50s horror movies, you would, you would know it. Uh, it's called the, the Creature or the Monster that Challenged the World. Uh, anyway... Uh, I was pitching, a, a, I came in for a pitch meeting to meet with Arthur Gardner, who was a, a, who was a supporter of me and a friend of mine. And I'm waiting in there, waiting to go in. And uh, Arthur comes out with, his, with one of his partners, Jules Levy, and, and says, oh, hi, Larry, uh, just give us a minute. This is Toby Hooper. We just met with him. Why don't you guys chat for a minute and say hello, and then, uh, and then we'll, we're going to make some notes, and then we'll call you in for the meeting. So I had like around, you know, 10, 15 minutes with Toby and, you know, he's charming, Texas, t t Texas uh, accent. So how you all doing there? What you up to? What are you working on? And I tell him I've got this project called The Fun House. And uh, I'm, uh, you know, what's it about? Well, it's about this traveling carnival, carnival that comes to town and these kids and they're not supposed to go. And he goes, it sounds fantastic. I love, I love traveling carnivals. When, when, when do you think you're going to have it done? And I said, I have a couple of more weeks of work on it, and, and then it'll be done. Uh, I had been, it took me a long time to come up with the idea of doing it. I wanted to do a haunted house story, and then I 
realize through the development process that the best haunted house in the world would actually be the previous one would be a traveling carnival, which is really a haunted house on wheels that travels from town to town and can get away with things. So he says, well, you know, I'd love to see it. You know, here's my number. And he scribbles his number down and gives it to me. And he says, when you're done, please give me a call. And I, I, I would love to see it. So then we say goodbye. And, uh, and then I go and I do my meeting and I'm pitching my story to them. And then afterwards, I'm like real excited because I just met Toby Hooper and I knew about the Texas Chainsaw Massacre and all this stuff. So I start doing my research and I watch it a couple of times because I hadn't really actually spent any time on Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And I realized what his sensibilities were and I immediately make some adjustments. And I'm thinking to myself, directors say this all the time, but they never really, you know, never really amounts to anything because it's a big crapshoot. Uh, I had been out here like almost a year. I, I had a couple of development deals, but you know, for low amount of monies, you know, uh, where, where they'll, yeah. they'll, they'll, commission, they'll commission you to do a story. And I finished the script and I call Toby up and he answers the phone. Hey, how you doing? Do you remember me? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, the script is finished. Can you, can, he says, can you get it to me? So I messenger it over to him and uh, I'm thinking it's going to take, take a while to hear from him. And uh, a couple of days later, he calls me up and says, Larry, I, I, I really like this. I want to try to figure something out. So uh, I have a friend, you know, who I'm going to try to get the money from and I want to option this for myself. So he had called up Mark Lester, who he knew, and Mark Lester, who would go on to be a director himself, he eventually directed uh, Firestarter and a, whole, a lot of other like, lower budget movies than that. Yeah. And, and he got, uh, he got uh, Mark Lester to come up with $1,000 and then... Mark Lester, Toby Hooper went to me and basically says, okay, here's a thousand dollars. We'll do a little letter of agreement. We're optioning it for a year. And then Mark Lester got to know Derek Power somehow. And Derek Power, I told you, was a producer who had done, the only thing he had really done that I know of was Peter Weir's uh, The Last Wave. Uh, and he started working for Mace Newfeld. It was all like very kismet, very... <laughs> It's like somebody up there really likes me because because he started working for Mace Neufeld, who was partners with Harvey Bernhard, and the two of them, B&H Productions or B&D Productions, uh, uh, had done uh, The Omen. Yeah. They produced The Omen, all mm -hmm. The Omens. Uh, and so Derek now became a development executive and a partner with, with, with uh, Mace Neufeld. And he brought him the project, which he had, had optioned through Mark Lester. Mm -hmm. And then, and then uh, Mace Newfeld got involved and then said, I like this. Maybe we, can, maybe, we can, maybe we can set this up as a real feature. Because it was originally going to be very low budget. And he got it to Universal Studios, to Tom Mount. Tom Mount originally said, I love this. We're going to do this. And then... Uh, a couple of weeks go by and, and I'm, all, I'm all excited and all fired up. I'm telling my whole family that we got a movie deal, we got a movie deal, Universal Studios. And then Tom Mount says, you know what, I changed my mind. We're, we're, we're not going to do this. They were trying to cash in on Halloween. And I think Friday the 13th was already coming out. And we're not doing this. And of course, I wanted to shoot myself because I told everybody that, yeah, absolutely. We're, that we're doing it. Yeah, and then, and then and Mace convinced Tom Mount to change his mind and they decided they would do it as a negative pickup for like around three and a half, four million dollars as a negative pickup. And then we did it. So that's that's the true story. I mean, it was it was a spec screenplay that was optioned by Mark Lester for Toby Hooper. And eventually it wound up at Universal because of who they were involved with. But it was a spec screenplay. It always was. Uh, which is, which is why you know, it was based on my original screenplay that was spec, not a work for hire. Had that been a work for hire, I wouldn't have had any cards in terms of the points. Yeah, I'm just thinking absolutely. about this now in the book. Because, because even if I, wanted, if I wanted to do a remake, I'm, I'm, I'm entitled now to do a, a novelization of my, own, of my own screenplay. And if I were to bring Dean Koontz into it, and I could, 
he did it as a work for hire. So he really, other than just giving me his blessing, he he doesn't he doesn't own the copyright. It's it, it, it's it, it's really Universal Studios and myself, and now it's only me because Universal gave up their copyright literary rights. Wow. So that's the true story about how this came about. And I've seen interviews that make me kind of crazy when when it was like you know we both came up with the idea together. It's 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 not. It's incredibly frustrating that. Well, yeah, but I've been telling the story a lot lately. So it yeah. feels, it I can feels I can understand why because it's you know it's it's your baby in the end, isn't it? It was such a it, it was so enlightening for me because I I was pretty young, I didn't have kids yet. We were struggling. We had been out here for around a year, and as I said, I wanted to do some kind of a haunted house. I had seen the movie Halloween. And I liked it very much, but I was convinced that the supernatural element was added as an afterthought because it's really, it, 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 it's a variation on Psycho. The, the beginning of that movie is it's a kid. It's a kid who winds up to be yeah. a, a, a killer who murders his sister, you know, uh, and, and there was nothing supernatural about that. He was locked up in an insane asylum. And then by the time you get to the end of the movie, it becomes supernatural. He's popping up in yeah. places in a way. And then when you get to the very end, when he's shot at, he goes flying through the window and he winds up, you know, the body winds up, it's a bunch of twigs. I believe at that, I mean, I was very naive at the time, obviously, but I believe at that time they said, well, wow, let's give it a supernatural ending and we'll be able to, you know, spin off a whole new series on this indestructible supernatural creature in my, that was in my mind i mean, I, I, I never confirmed it uh, but i'm pretty sure yeah. if you look at the movie carefully it's not there so i thought i could do better and i wanted to do some kind of a haunted house movie i was playing around with ideas and then i remembered when i was 16 or 17 going to the carnival and and being so turned on by it and so so rich with with with, with colors and, and and atmosphere and and craziness and 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 uh, and legitimate danger. I had a line in there that they took out, where one of the Barkers, I mean, one of the Carnies. The Carnies are really grifters. They're very dangerous people. As a matter of fact, in the last year, there was some murder that happened. I forget what part of America, in the United States it happened in. But they traced it back to a Carney worker. So it's like they're still Carney workers and they're still yeah. doing this. But I wanted to. Uh, I wanted to get into the into that nightmare. Where there was a scene in the movie where one of the carny workers is, says, actually says, "How come every time when there's an accident on one of the rides and people are killed, the lines double? Okay, the lines double when they reopen it." And then I had the other guy saying offhand to the guy saying, "But ain't you ever read Sigmund Freud?" <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I love that. Yeah. Anyway, but it was it was the whole idea of the of the danger. The, yeah. of the, people think carnivals are very safe places because it's regulated by the government. They have inspectors that come around. There are accidents that happen all the time in traveling carnivals. They, 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 they have accidents that happen all the time. So it, it's the whole atmosphere is fraught, and you know it goes back to the movie Freaks, which is a great film, by the way. Oh, it's classic. Anyway, it, it deals with this whole thing about reality, non-reality geeks are they real they're not real is it pretend is it you know, is it is, is, is it supernatural is it this and you know it, it's uh for me it's it's kind of like it was the ultimate it was the ultimate horror movie that you that one could tell absolutely well larry i'm gonna wrap it up there um what we'll do is i'll just stop this recording and then i'll do a little wrap up and then we'll just chat uh, about um our next, uh, well, we should definitely do another recording about a lot of other stuff we spoke about yesterday. So, uh, Larry Block, thank you very much. My absolute pleasure. I, I, I wish you good luck in everything that you're doing. It sounds, it sounds so exciting and so energizing. And uh, because I will tell you, horror fans are the greatest people in the world. There is, when there are legitimate horror fans, you, you can tell. Because they are willing, they are, they so want to have that, that jump scare. They so want to have that release of, of, yeah. of, of, of energy that they are also extraordinarily forgiving when there's something that doesn't work right in the movie. They don't care. They, 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 really, they really don't care. They just, they just, they just love the genre. 
I think it's in their DNA. I think when these kids were growing up, their parents used to like to like spook them. And so that they have like this combination of fear and love built into them when it comes to horror movies. And, uh, and it's an amazing escape valve for, uh, Absolutely. I, I, that's the, that's the reason I started this festival. And, uh, where can, uh, where's the best place that people can find you? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm in my old age, I'm like all over the place. I'm on IMBD, uh, as, uh, Lawrence, Lawrence J block, the fun house, uh, uh, there are th two other Lawrence blocks. One is the mystery writer who I finally got him to, he's great. He's a genius, but I got him to, to, on his website, he says, if you're interested in Larry Block, the screenwriter, go to, go, go to this IMDb. Uh, I've got a funny in... story about a mix-up like that. Sorry, yeah, I'll, I'll tell you about that when we stop, but yeah. I'm on, I'm, on, uh, I'm on Instagram big time, a little bit too big time, under at Larry Block screenwriter. And I know that sounds like a pompous thing to say, but I had to do that because of the Larry Block, the, the uh, mystery writer, and the Larry Block, the actor who passed away, but people keep mixing these things up. So it had to be at Larry Block Screenwriter. And I'm on YouTube, which I'm really trying to build up now. And that's under Lars Block. But if you really want to get to it right away, you just do, uh, you can do Larry Block, The Fun House, or uh, uh, Larry Block, Toby Hooper, or Larry Block, The Me Gun for Horror Show, which is like my big passion project that I'm doing right now. Uh, and it, it should come up right away. So, well, thank you very much, and uh, we'll see you soon. Okay, my pleasure. And again, I, 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 I hope that I hope this uh, I hope this does great for you. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna Absolutely. push it. But I hope your festival it goes way beyond your wildest dreams and just grows and grows and grows and then becomes like mega. Yeah, I really appreciate that, Larry. So, and then don't and then don't turn shitty when it does, please. No. <laughs> I know. I, I'd rather I'd rather keep it than uh, well, depending on how much is involved. I'm no, not gonna, it's, like, uh, Com it's like Comic Con then. <laughs> yeah. Comic Con now. You know, yeah, I'm yeah, talking yeah. About it, 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 it just well, this is this the last thing I'll say before we uh, uh, we finish is that uh, the sense of community is the biggest thing and. Uh, connecting with people like yourself on Instagram and many of our filmmakers. And we've had filmmakers from Turkey, Australia, South America, United States. It's kind of growing on its own. And uh, it, it's, it's fascinating with the, the judges we've got involved. We've got an uh, Oscar nominated BAFTA award winner uh, now as a judge. So it's uh, crazy. And that came about based on, you know who I'm talking about. We mentioned yesterday, it's not officially announced yet. Um, his daughter's a big horror fan so that worked out a treat uh, so yeah they're going to watch the film together so uh, Larry Block thank you very much I'll see you my, soon my, my, my absolute pleasure